it is not, you know, a record that comes from very deep within him. But it was a hit. I mean, it was a big hit, and it had a big hit single in his sort of arrangement of rock and roll music, which was a distinctively new kind of arrangement, you know, and bore his mark. But a lot of the other songs were rearranged in ways that I think people found like unsettling or off-putting, and certainly the band did, and they really didn't like the way that he was, you know, the sort of sound he'd come up with. But as good as your sin is that time again to shed the load of the road on the run again. Summer skies and a flies and a warm sun is one for all, all for one, all for all the fun. The revelations kind of come when you least expect them. They come, uh, you know, I mean, he wrote a song called It's OK, which is a very do-it-again kind of thing. It's, it, it's nice. I, I like that song, actually. Uh, had to phone you sort of has it, but it's, it's a very light, frothy record. It's OK might be the one thing he did on 15 Big Ones, right? That actually, there was some effort behind. I mean, I listened, every time I listen to that song, it ends up engulfing me in the joy that the intent is. It's like Do It Again Part 2. You know, it really, that particular track works quite well. But off the top of my head, I can't think of anything else on 15 Big Ones that really, you know, kicks my butt. The original Brian Wilson songs on 15 Big Ones are, I think, pretty ordinary. Nothing special. It's OK is a good example, which is just OK. I mean, the vocals are really nice, and, you know, it's a nice production. But it's, you know, it doesn't just dazzle you. Uh, I think a, one song that's really telling is the one called That Same Song which is a song about looking back on the songs that you grew up with and that you remember. And uh, they even go back in music history to Gregorian chant and talk about the whole history of music. Back in time with just rhythm and rhyme, Gregorian chants were a real big thing. They took that genetic harmony. It was a different sound, but had the same meaning. I can imagine what a song like that might have been like if Brian Wilson had done it in the mid-60s when he was at the height of his creative powers. You know, he might have found some musical way to demonstrate this sense of a historical sweep within the song. Whereas the way they do it in 15 Big Ones in that same song, you know, it's all in the same style. The music is all in the same style. It's a perfectly pleasant little song, typical of the other originals in that era and on that album. Uh, but but the, there's no real organic connection between the message that the lyric has and the music itself. But the public couldn't get enough of the Beach Boys or the return of their enigmatic leader. With the Brian's Back campaign in full swing, Wilson was thrust into the public eye like never before. It kicked off this ginormous tour in the summer of 76 where the Beach Boys are back and guess what? Now Brian's with them. And he's playing on stage. He's got this big silk bathrobe, which sort of both alluded to and satirized his bedroom years. You know, and I remember seeing that show in 1976 up in Seattle and feeling like this was awesome. Like this was exactly what I had hoped for. And they're playing massive amounts of oldies. Now the new stuff is maybe 25%. But Brian was way off his game. He barely sang. When he did sing, it was this kind of very rusty croak. It was a weird kind of moment, but if you squinted just right and blocked off certain things, it kind of worked, you know? A recluse who was suddenly pushed into the media spotlight, Wilson's discomfort was often all too evident. Yet for the Beach Boys, the record label and the audience, the main thing was that he was there. He hit the interview circuit, made public appearances, and took part in an NBC special featuring a comedy routine with Saturday Night Live stars Dan Aykroyd and John Belushi all celebrating the return of a great American composer. But others were keen on digging a little deeper, including Rolling Stone scribe David Felton, who spent unprecedented time with Wilson and his publicity-hungry therapist, Eugene Landy. In his seminal article, The Healing of Brother Brian, he documented a return to the limelight that was far more complex than the one the marketing machine was selling. I think the question to me, it was not so much about what's he going to be like, but it was, what is he like after I met him? Like, is this the real Brian Wilson? How much have I seen uh, of him? I never could tell, for example, I mean, G Eugene Landy, his, his sh shrink turned 
uh, public you know, exploiter or whatever, uh, the villain of the piece, he said Brian doesn't have that much sense of his humor. And I never could, I never knew the answer to that. Does he or does he? Sometimes I thought he would, had a very wry sense of humor, and other times I felt he talked almost like a robot or somebody sort of not programmed but just stiff and and without emotion, without affectation. He does what he's told and he doesn't do much else. He answers your questions but he doesn't offer too much. And I don't think that was being difficult. I think he really was waking up, waking up. And I don't think he exactly knew what to do other than what people sort of showed him to do. There were certain things he knew a lot about. But how he should act, he just didn't act very much, you know, and that way he kept out of trouble. He was having to learn to have a good time without all the things that previously allowed him to have a good time. It's pretty difficult. So he, I think he had a, felt he had a big pressure to behave and to cooperate. And, you know, and if he didn't, he'd hear about it from Landy often in front of everybody else. Felton's article presented Brian in a very honest, forthright way. He clearly hit it off with the guy. Brian welcomed him into his inner sanctum. So he's getting Brian's thoughts, but he's also getting this kind of not so vaguely poisonous thing happening with Landy. Because Landy, one of Landy's great flaws is that he was a complete attention whore, that he needed the attention. And the moment he got his hooks, you know, the moment he got into a relationship with somebody like Brian, he wanted to stand up with him and be kind of like, you know, the, his partner. Landy makes you tell that kind of story. I mean, he's such a performer. And just from the very beginning of his interview, I mean, you knew you had a character you had to, you couldn't, you couldn't stop him. I mean, he, 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 to him, he was the star of the story, and I let him be one of the stars, you know. He was full of himself. And, you know, I always thought he was bad-mannered and that he was exploiting his work with Brian at the expense of Brian, and I mentioned that. He was not an uh, ethical guy, I don't think. And, you know, he did so many other things that you thought the whole thing might have been a scam. However, one way to keep a person from taking drugs is having a guard there to keep him from taking drugs. It's called prison, but it was in his home. They were putting him out to be gone over. You know, they shoved him back, in the sp and he kind of became the locus of their image, the great Brian Wilson. And Felton's story, for all the kind of, you know, the facets that he brings in, including these kind of dark, horrifying facets, sort of ends on a, on a kind of a note of, of hope. Brian's writing songs, you know, he's got a bunch of stuff. He's playing new songs for Felton, which Felton seems to like a lot. And it seemed to bode well, but it really didn't. By the end of the year, with his fees having doubled since taking charge of Brian, Landy was fired by the Beach Boys' new manager, Steve Love. Yet his techniques had apparently been a great success and Wilson entered the studio in October 1976 to begin recording the new tracks that he had played to Felton. His confidence growing, he also made two television appearances without the band behind him, on The Mike Douglas Show and Saturday Night Live, and the public was given a far more intimate performance than the live shows had allowed. Sat behind a piano, his voice gruff, the Randy Newman influence was now clear, but it left Beach Boys fans disheartened. This is a song that comes off our current album, and the album is called 15 Big Ones, and it's called Back Home. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I've gone back this summer to Ohio. I know it's when Brian appeared on Saturday Night Live, America just said, this guy ain't back. You know, if you've heard him sing Back Home, and I, I'm not going to do my impersonation, but, you know, in private, maybe sometime. <laughs> but come on, man, that's not Brian Wilson's voice. But when you have the gift of the voice that Brian Wilson had, and then you cut to Louis Armstrong, you just got to ask why. This is a guy who 10 years earlier would stop the vocal sessions in the middle of a song because he didn't think there was enough emotion in the ooze. And you get to a point 10 years later where not only is he, I think, consciously singing in this gruff, rough, Randy Newman, Tom Waits-esque kind of voice, but he's kind of not caring or paying too close attention. I mean, he's mostly in tune, but he doesn't care that much anymore. Yet Brian was pursuing very different artistic aims than simply satisfying his core fan base and this new voice would be prominent on the material that he was developing. 
With the rest of the Beach Boys otherwise engaged, he was left to his own devices in Brother Studios with engineer Earl Mankey. And having rediscovered his enthusiasm for recording, he began to experiment with a passion that had been absent for the best part of a decade. If 15 big ones was to get Brian comfortable in the studio by working with all of his friends from the old days, then as Brian came into the studio each day to work on new songs, I think the idea at that point was, let's bring in the guys one at a time as Brian needs them, you know. Given that structure, Brian ended up playing a whole lot more of his own instrumentation than he did. And no offense to Brian, but uh, uh, given that, it, it tended to be a lot more amateurish and a lot more what Brian played. The songs had a similarity because he had just learned how to work a synthesizer and he had his, he had his favorite drum pattern that he always played and his favorite bass lines that he always played. So in the end, it was much more a Brian Wilson thing, I think, than even anyone might have hoped because of the uh, preponderance of Brian playing all the instruments. Uh, it was basically a Brian Wilson home, home recording. Wilson's personal input into these songs was not just musical. Landy had also encouraged him to write lyrics, to get his thoughts onto paper, and to take inspiration from anything around him, no matter how insignificant. Not only did this lead to a wealth of material being quickly written, but it also created a catalogue of very personal work, detailing both the commonplace concerns and the inner life of its author with song titles including Bring Your Own Comb and Quit Using My Toothpaste. They may have seemed left field or odd. I do think that they are totally autobiographical and the same as it's a lot easier to walk over and grab the synthesizer instead of uh, you know, calling in a string section. It's a lot easier to write the words than to try to get together with a lyricist. And uh, uh, I'm sure that that would have been the easiest out for Brian. And uh, you know, and he, Brian did work, write songs. It's not like he had ever never written any lyrics, lyrics but uh, Brian Wilson lyrics maybe weren't as familiar to the public as those other lyricists were. And so uh, the Beach Boy Love You songs might have seemed odder uh, because nobody really knew what Brian was really like, you know. And some of his bandmates wanted to keep it that way. By the end of 1976, Wilson had recorded enough tracks for two albums and his initial intention was to release the most personal material as a solo album entitled Brian Loves You. Yet when the other band members heard the results of his labor, they were far from impressed. And although the resultant LP would bear the name The Beach Boys and feature the involvement of the entire group, like Pet Sounds before it, the album bore the mark of one very singular creator. My opinion of the, the Love You album is that it's a Brian record. And I guess it's because I know how it went down. It was a Brian record. He had no thoughts at all about being a Beach Boy. No, he didn't want to be a Beach Boy. No, he didn't want to do surfing songs for sure. And uh, he was just being, he was most comfortable being an artist, you know, being whatever popped out of his head. that Brian could have used a lot more support, not just from business people that you would expect wouldn't ever give you the support, they never have any sensitivity, but especially uh, Mike and Al, uh, if, they, if there was, there, it wasn't just a lack of support, support, it was an antagonism towards them, you know? They'd, Brian would play something that he'd be, been working on that he was proud of, and, uh, you know, they'd look at each other and, you know, give back, you know, they, you know, Alan would say to, to Dennis, he'd give him the finger underneath his palm, you know, when he hear the thing playing, you know, where, where Brian was trying to do his best, you know, and I felt like that was just a total lack of support. And I suspect it's still that way. And I don't see how Brian is going to produce in a situation like that. Mm -hmm. 